Hi, everyone. Welcome to PRS Grand Rounds. Thank you very much for your patience. We'll start momentarily. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we'll be starting momentarily. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome to PRS Grand Round. My name is Min Jung Cho, and I'm one of the PRS resident ambassadors at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you very much for joining us. Next slide, please. With regards to tonight, this is a reminder that classic PRS and PRS Global Open Articles cultivated to complement this lecture are available for free on prsjournal.com and prsglobalopen.com. Next slide, please. We want to thank all of you for helping us win several national awards by being part of this lecture series. All of our past lectures, Q&A, and articles can be found on prsjournal.com. Next slide, please. And finally, please ask us questions by commenting on this Facebook Live video throughout the lecture and during Q&A. We'll get to many questions as we can during the Q&A. We do ask you to uh, keep the questions as short as possible so that we can fit everything we can on the screen. Next slide, please. Tonight, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Matthew Hanasono. Dr. Hanasono completed his residency in head and neck surgery at Stanford University, posse surgery residency at Cornell University, and microsurgery fellowship at Emmy Anderson Cancer Center. He's currently a professor and reconstructive microsurgery fellowship program director at Emmy Anderson Cancer Center. He specializes in head and neck reconstruction and he'll be discussing virtual surgical planning and head and neck reconstruction tonight with us thank you hi this is uh, matt hanasono from md anderson cancer center i'd like to thank min jong cho uh, and dr rod rorick for inviting me uh, to present Grand Rounds tonight i'd also like to thank the staff at prs aaron weinstein and maddie ramos for their help in presenting this tonight. I'm gonna to speak about virtual surgical planning and head and neck reconstruction. Uh, let's start with a little definition. Virtual surgical planning is one type of 
CAD CAM or computer aided design with computer aided manufacturing in which we can pre-plan a surgery virtually on the computer and then use computer control to print three-dimensional models to help us guide our surgeries. Here's an example of a model that we made at MD Anderson uh, about 15 years ago. This is actually a 3D printed model. It's not uh, much like the ones that you'd see today. Uh, it's a powder bound together layer by layer uh, with glue and, and we would take it to the dental laboratory where we would build fibulas out of dental wax, uh, which our dental colleagues would then cast into acrylic for us. We would take these fibula models then to the OR and pre-bend titanium hardware to help us with our surgery. And then on the right side was a construct that we had to help us position our fibulas accurately in 3D space. Fast forward a few years and uh, a lot of virtual surgical planning now it has been taken over by professional software engineers and 3D printing in industry. Here you can see a virtual surgical plan and here the real advantage is that we can rotate the head in three dimensions and double check the occlusion to get our fibula reconstruction just right. Stereolithography refers to a specific type of 3D printing. It's the use of acrylic polymer cured by a laser or a light source. And the next advance in um, medical virtual surgical planning was the creation of computer generated cutting guides, which allowed us to make our osteotomies at the precise angles and lengths needed to, to copy the uh, three-dimensional uh, plan that we had achieved on the computer. And you can see here on the right side that the fibula looks exactly like the model that we had planned. And here's the completed reconstruction in this particular patient in which we used a fibula to reconstruct the mid-face. And ultimately, the patient received osteointegrated implants with restored uh, dentition. It's not enough, uh, though, I think, to create models and subjectively uh, tell everybody that they are a big uh, leap forward. I think it's important that we present hard data. And what the uh, top line really shows is that, um, at least in single flap cases, that we're saving more than an hour and a half on the average. And that, that's a big deal in a seven, eight or nine hour case, um, especially uh, if you're doing this all the time. Then measuring accuracy, that's always been a challenge in reconstructive surgery, uh, as I'm sure as well in, um, in aesthetic surgery. And how do, you do, how do you do that? And one idea we had was to take fixed bony landmarks like the condyle, the gonion, and the nathion, and compare the preoperative to the postoperative positions. And what we found compared to uh, contemporary controls uh, by uh, performed by uh, traditional methods, hand bending the plates, uh, trial and error, eyeballing the reconstruction, we're always more accurate when we use the virtual surgical planning. Another way of measuring accuracy was to see how close our completed reconstruction uh, came to the idealized computer uh, plan. And we found on the average in our early case series, that we were within 2.4 millimeters and about three and a half degrees of accuracy. Uh, and I would argue that we are way more accurate nowadays, um, partially because of improvements in cutting guides, uh, but also because of custom made hardware that's now available, which was the next step uh, in improvement. So here's an er earlier case, uh, which I think would be ideal for virtual surgical planning. This patient has advanced mandibular osteoradionecrosis. If you look at the CT scan on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that there's bilateral mandibular fractures in the center of the screen. Uh, you see that he has an open bite and a cross bite. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that this is going to be a particularly complicated case because he has an orocutaneous fistula with exposed mandible. You can see below his earlobe. So we're talking about a double free flap reconstruction, a fibula osteocutaneous flap, and a soft tissue flap for the outside, in this case, an ALT flap. This is a very large specimen, as you can see, because of the bilateral mandibular fractures. So really, um, an advantage of doing virtual surgical planning is that we were able to play around on the computer uh, and manipulate the um, 
sizes of the segments just so that we were able to reconstruct the entire almost whole mandible with a single single fibular free flap otherwise we would have had to possibly do two free flaps uh, and still achieve good occlusion postoperatively. Here's that computer generated cutting guide and it shows that I am exhausting every last bit of the patient's uh, available fibula. The completed reconstruction that looks very much like the mandibular model and you can see here we are still using hand band plates for this uh, particular reconstruction but the time savings and the accuracy uh, pays off in this type of really complicated and arduous type of reconstruction. Uh, as I mentioned, the next advance forward was in the development of custom-made titanium hardware for fixation of the fibular segments, um, or really any osteocutaneous free flap segments. Uh, compared to the traditional uh, plate that we bend in the operating room, these, um, these plates have never been bent by human hands, so they have no weak spots. And it turns out that they are at least, I've been told, 18 times stronger uh, than uh, and resistant to fracture uh, compared to the similarly uh, sized um, traditional reconstruction plate. Now these aren't 3D printed plates, they are milled plates, so that means that uh, they're uh, shaved down from a solid block of titanium under computer control. Uh, these were the first types of plates available to us and um, now, uh, we do have 3D printed plates. This is a different technology. This is indeed uh, like the creation of the models, printed layer by layer, so there are fused particles of titanium. And what this has allowed us to do uh, is to really uh, have more freedom with the design of our hardware. And you can see here that this is done with a very high resection on the patient's right ramus, almost to the condylar neck and the um, uh, coronoid process. But we, I was able to uh, design a fibula, I'm uh, sorry, a titanium hardware that wraps around uh, the remnant of the condyle. And normally, if we had used a regular plate, we'd probably only get one, maybe two screws on there. But because we can design the plate in any way we want, I was able to get five screws on there. That's a very stable fixation, and in this case, allows us to use the patient's original temporal mandibular joint, which, as you can imagine, is far superior to any substitute that we might have, such as um, a rib cartilage or a metal prosthesis. Turning to maxillary reconstructions, that's always been a challenge. Um, how to take uh, a fibula free flap, which is a rod shape or linear free flap, and make it look like the very complicated shape of the maxilla. You can see on the left side a, a resection that looks more like a Lafort 1 osteotomy that goes straight across the alveolus. That's fairly straightforward. You just create a kind of a, a U-shaped fibular construct, and that, that's fine. But when you resect the entire maxilla, which you would see on the right side, bilateral total maxillectomies, you have to get more creative with your design. And you can see we've added a little bit of little wings to the side of the, uh, our design and uh, canted the fibula reconstruction downward. We've made some advances since then, but uh, that was our original design. Um, and here uh, is an example of that Lefort 1 osteotomy. This was a mucosal melanoma. Uh, of the hard palate, so she underwent uh, a uh, palatal maxillectomy resection, and we designed an upside down U uh, with a fibula free flap. You can see there on the right, um, again looking very similar to the computer plan, and here in her post-opera photos you can see that we've restored her height width and projection very accurately. Um, looks good if in, in real surgical uh, time, you know, the degree of accuracy that's necessary for maxillary reconstruction is very, very high. If you're off by a few millimeters, you change the patient's facial appearance, their position of their nose and their occlusion. Here's that fibula with wings, which we term the omega-shaped fibula flap. It looks like the Greek letter omega when you hold it, look at it transversely. I think if you look at the reconstruction plate, you can imagine the Greek letter omega. Um, and just showing that we could restore uh, very large defects. This is a giant ameloblastoma distorting this uh, poor uh, woman's face. And just by accurately restoring the craniofacial skeleton with no additional soft tissue um, uh, surgery, we can really get a, a fairly good restoration of her facial appearance with good facial symmetry.
Moving on to dental restoration, as I mentioned, this is a very important part of uh, maxillary and mandibular reconstruction, and I would say that no reconstruction is really complete without restoring the teeth. These are osseointegrated implants, that's what you're looking at, and if you're not that familiar with them, uh, what we think of of dental implants are really the uh, sockets um, buried into bone uh, to which uh, an additional piece, a post, or, or what we would term an abutment is attached that are ultimately attached to prosthetic teeth. Now these osseointegrated implants are coated with titanium oxide and if you looked at them under a high power microscope, you'd see that they have little pores and nooks and crannies to which bone will actually uh, grow into and that's what makes them osseointegrated and it's a process that takes several months but uh, it creates a very tight bond to the bone to the point that uh, removal of these implants is very difficult and it actually possibly breaking the bone. So after the process of osseointegration, we typically um, perform a second stage surgery, uncover the implants, remove uh, cover screws that, that were plugging up the holes and replace them with these posts or abutments to which a prosthesis snaps onto. Uh, that's one, one technique of, of, of doing uh, dental implant restoration. And here's a, a restoration that we did. This is a patient, uh, a young patient with a left hemimaxillectomy, although you can hardly tell here, except for the scar on her left neck where we did our microvascular anastomosis. And here's an intraoral view showing her uh, fibula skin uh, paddle with the osseointegrated implants and her completed dental restoration. Now, the, the important uh, point about getting custom-made hardware isn't just that it saves us time, it also allows the surgeon to specify the location and the spacing of um, the uh, screws that hold the, uh, the fibula or, or other bone to the, um, uh, to the reconstruction plate itself. And because we can uh, space those out as we wish, we can space them out such that there is room in between for dental implants. We can't really be having the screws hitting the implants. Um, so this is one big factor that now allows us to do immediate dental implant placement. I mean, we could do it before, but it was uh, really um, eyeballing, uh, you know, uh, touch and go uh, situation that came at the end of a very, very long surgery um, after the completed uh, rigid fixation and microvascular anastomosis. So I think this immediate uh, dental implantation, which is done here, showing here, while the fibula is still being harvested, that, that uh, computer-generated cutting guide actually has drill slots for the um, osseointegrated implants that can be done early in the day while the uh, flap is still being harvested, which our dental colleagues and uh, we as plastic surgeons uh, uh, really appreciate because we don't like anyone manipulating our completed reconstruction after microvascular anastomosis. Um, and you can see on the right side that the completed reconstruction and the dental uh, implants with their cover screws are visible. Here's the completed restoration uh, after the implants were uncovered, abutments were placed, and the prosthesis was delivered to the patient. Just another example, this time of a maxillary reconstruction. And what this shows here is not only are we able to space out the implants right where we want them uh, to restore occlusion, but also that we're even able to plan the position of the implant within the fibular bone so that it's in the thickest part of the bone, which adds to implant stability. That 3D printed plate um, allowing us to go with virtually any design that we specify. In this case, I uh, asked for multiple arms so that I could um, uh, rigidly fixate and strongly fixate this to the maxillary buttresses. So that's a very stable, long-lasting uh, reconstruction. Here's the osseointegrated implants and abutments place, and you can see there the patient smiling with her uh, prosthetic teeth. The last uh, thing I'd like to talk about is orbital wall reconstruction. And the point here is that in our experience, we've, we've tried it all, bone graft, titanium mesh, porous polyethylene, even vascularized bone. And they all have complications, most notable of which are deficiencies in positioning, uh, resulting in potentially anophthalmos or uh, diplopia, and even in the worst case scenario, blindness if the implant or bone graft impinges on the optic nerve. 
Um, in general, uh, I think if you look at the trauma literature, which uh, has is far larger series than in the free flap literature, you would see that bone grafts are relatively more resistant to infection, but more difficult to position accurately, and so have even higher rate of uh, positional problems like anophthalmos and diplopia. Um, here you can see how I can use a medical model though to pre-shape uh, my bone grafts, plan uh, their positioning, and place them more accurately and there's a restoration here on the left hand is the preoperative uh, of, um, CT scan. You can see that the eyeball is retro displaced as well as um, inferiorly displaced or hypophthalmic uh, versus on the right side, the completed reconstruction, which is in the correct position uh, with the eyeball in the correct position. Now we can also do this with custom uh, printed titanium plates. Uh, and I think these plates are far more accurate than anything I can do by hand. Uh, this one, it was built from a mirror image of the contralateral side, which was normal. You can see here that it's a low profile plate uh, with no sharp edges. And I think this uh, potentially has the, uh, the capability of decreasing complications such as extrusion or exposure of the titanium hardware. Uh, which is a big deal in our head and neck cancer population because they're all radiated, uh, because many of them are radiated. Here's an example of one that we placed uh, via a conjunctival approach and the uh, pre and post operative, again, showing a better uh, position of the globe, uh, which was originally anophthalmic and hypophthalmic. And that uh, imp implant going all the way back, but not impinging on the optic nerve. My final case kind of puts all of those uh, technologies together. This is a patient with a very large uh, maxillary and orbital and skull base uh, sarcoma uh, for which she is receiving a resection of the medial, inferior, and lateral orbital walls, a portion of the zygoma, and uh, the um, two-thirds of the patient's maxilla. So we designed a two-piece um, orbital implant that restores the orbital walls. And the reason we did it two pieces, uh, simply more for our convenience, it's such, it would be such a large implant if it was a single piece um, that I was worried about being able to fit it in through a fairly limited incision and you know, uh, on the off chance that there's a complication it had to be removed would also be very, very difficult to get out without making very large facial incisions. Um, couple that with our uh, 3D printed titanium hardware to hold the, um, the fibula together. And you can see here I've designed a double barrel configuration, which I now use rather than the um, old uh, omega shaped fibula flap. And that really allows me to, um, to do some pretty complex shapes in ways that I could have done in the past with mini plates, but you know, working with mini plates really takes a high degree of skill. And as I said, being off by a few millimeters has a big difference in uh, facial shape. Here's the resection and the reconstruction. Um, and uh, you can see here that the fibula, the one of the, uh, the skin petals restores the oral uh, mucosa of the palate, and then I took a second skin petal and deepithelialized it to give uh, a soft tissue bulk to the face, uh, as well as to protect against uh, any possible chance of exposure of that titanium implant long term. So, in summary, you know what I would say is that uh, virtual surgical plan planning is a is a fantastic communication and teaching tool between surgeon and patient, between reconstructive surgeon and oncologic surgeon, and between faculty and trainee. That can be done anywhere in the world that has internet. Uh, we and many others have shown an operative time savings, uh, which eventually uh, ultimately results in a cost savings. Uh, increased accuracy, which I think is has you know we can't put a price on um, that we can use more durable and more accurate titanium custom made plates, and it, it's improved our ability to place immediate dental implants. The disadvantages are that the technology is certainly costly. It does require preoperative planning time. Uh, the software engineers that we work with nowadays are very facile and experienced with this. Um, with this technology and the software, and it really uh, most planning sessions last about 15, 20 minutes with me. Um, but it, and it, it does require a recent fine cut CT scan. Uh, we want the most up-to-date imagery uh, so that 
um, that we can get the most accurate reconstruction. Otherwise, uh, as the final disadvantage is that the extent of the defect may change if the pathology changes uh, between the time of planning and the time of surgery. Um, I would say then that the indications for virtual surgical planning are certainly for very large exophytic tumors uh, that distort the facial architecture and make it very hard to uh, know where to place our plates, screws, uh, and bone, uh, bone flaps and grafts. Um, likewise, displaced or comminuted fractures, patients with prior resection or prior reconstruction. Um, some have said that uh, virtual surgical planning makes fibula and other osteocutaneous free flap surgery more accessible to the young surgeon or to uh, the surgeon with infrequent microvascular bony reconstruction experience. I certainly use it on almost every maxillary reconstruction because of the higher degree of accuracy needed and also the difficulty of working with very small plates and um, smaller bony segments. I think it's uh, very, very helpful for immediate also integrated implants and now makes that accessible, which is also, I should note, a, a big time savings to the patient. They can get their reconstruction completed in a matter of months where in the past it would take, uh, I would tell patients that it was nearly a year long process. And finally, orbital reconstruction, where I think the degree of accuracy needs to be the highest in order to restore uh, uh, adequate vision. So that really begs the question that perhaps virtual surgical planning is indicated in almost every reconstruction, except perhaps the most straightforward single segment or possibly two segment uh, bony flap reconstructions. So that's, that's it for me. I'm uh, looking forward to questions and answers. Uh, once again, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the staff of PRS, Dr. Rorick and Dr. Cho, uh, for inviting me to uh, present this and share uh, my experience with you tonight. All right, thank you, Don. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hanasono, for a fantastic talk. Uh, vertical surgical planning over the years uh, became a cornerstone of a complex head, head and neck reconstruction. And thank you very much for sharing your experience and wisdom with us tonight. Reminder for everyone uh, Classic PRS and Pericles are out for free uh, on prjournal.com and prsglobalopen.com. Uh, next slide, please. So now we'll move on to the Q&A. Please ask questions uh, by commenting on this Facebook Live video as the Q&A goes on. Uh, we do recommend uh, short que questions as short as possible. Uh, now we'll move on to the uh, Q&A. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with our first question. It's actually from me. So we'll, um, you know, as a trainee, uh, we were wondering what are uh, what are your advice for those who are not familiar with vertical surgical uh, virtual surgical planning or the trainees who doesn't have a lot of experience using BSP and how can we start and uh, how do we make sure uh, we could troubleshoot uh, the planning? Yeah, you know, I, I think the learning curve for virtual surgical planning is really quite short. Um, uh, anything that you can visualize, you know, nowadays, in, at least in the U.S., uh, most centers will um, use third-party software engineers, so that they really do the um, the hard work uh, manipulating the software, which kind of looks a little bit like uh, Photoshop or, or uh, uh, other image-guided uh, software. Um, and so, uh, you know, you really you go online and you plan with them. Um, uh, describe to them the, the number of segments that you want and the overall shape and really just confirm that you've got a good shape and good occlusion in three dimensions and they, they can rotate it in left, right, uh, worm's eye view um, so that you can du double check that and then uh, 
really um, everything comes packaged to you in a kit uh, with a, fairly rapidly, you know, anywhere in the world that uh, that express delivery uh, can serve. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go on with the next question. Um, waiting for the question to pop up. All right, great. So this is question from Rami. Um, the question he has is that, have you noticed any significant reduction in the cost of US uh, using BSP for complex uh, cranial facial, cranial maxillary facial reconstruction over the years? And then uh, another question he has is that, what is your advice for small programs who might have a limited budget and how can they restart using uh, VSP as part of their program? Now, it's always been a, a, a tough question. There's um, how do we pay for this relatively expensive technology? And you know, the, a number of studies have shown that if you um, really look at the amount of time you save, hour and a half, two hours, and compare that to operative anesthesia time, um, you usually still come out ahead uh, and, and do save money uh, by by using virtual surgical planning. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the cost is maybe not come down, but stayed stable over the years. It's usually bundled into the cost of uh, custom made hardware. So um, to some extent that that cost is uh, passed on to um, the patient. At, at least that's how we tend to do it in the United States. Um, but it remains a, a good question. It, it's interesting that other, other uh, question I, I've been asked is really which way do I see virtual surgical planning going because um, just as I have said the third party professional software engineers and um, implant and plate manufacturing companies have advanced so far and created a really uh, easy to use convenient product for the surgeon at the same time 3D printers have come down considerably. They, they have really come down uh, considerably in price. That that powder um, uh, printer that I uh, showed in the beginning of my talk probably cost $100,000 for our institution to have. And it, it, of course, became outdated very rapidly um, versus, you know, for a few thousand dollars, really not much more than a regular printer, um, you could have your own printer. Uh, and so um, I have noticed uh, definitely for smaller programs, programs abroad, um, that they are purchasing their own printers and doing their own virtual surgical planning on their own before surgery. And that, that makes a lot of sense to me uh, as well. One thing that um, I don't know that many places will ever be able to do on their own, however, is titanium, uh, creating their own custom made titanium hardware. Titanium is certainly um, a, a difficult, uh, you know, industrial process. And the, the material itself is uh, flammable or explosive, so um, not something that we would want to be doing in our garage, for instance. Right. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Nelson Rodriguez. Uh, his question is: What will be the minimal bone cortical height to choose immediate osteointegrated implants? Yeah, you know, you generally speaking uh, for the oral surgeons and, and dentists, they generally want um, at least a couple of millimeters surrounding the um, implant on every side. So you don't want any bony exposure. Uh, implants vary in height. In general, we, we've always wanted at least um, like eight millimeters to 10 millimeters of bony height, um, you know, uh, for uh, these implants, um, although I, I've been I've been told now that shorter uh, implants are available, they may not be as stable. Um, but I think it's useful, particularly if you're going to be using uh, thinner bone like uh, scapular free flap, um, uh, for instance, or uh, radial radial bone free flap. All right, thank you. And our next question is my one of my co-ambassador. Oh, I guess oh, I will follow with Marlene's uh, question. Uh, her question is, what is your experience with integrated implants and radiotherapy in the post-operative period? Right, you know, so people have tried different things. Most surgeons uh, who do, free, uh, you know, fibular free flaps are conservative about um, putting dental implants in a radiated fibula bone. 
Um, we know anecdotally um, there haven't been a ton of large series uh, that fibular bone that's been radiated uh, is less likely to stably hold osteointegrated implants. Uh, in the worst case scenario, you put the implants in and you risk the fracture of the bone um, or osteoradiated necrosis developing. Uh, so we've been conservative about that. Some groups um, have proceeded with that nevertheless by administering preoperative hyperbaric oxygen. I think the data on that uh, remains somewhat controversial. Um, what uh, our group is trying to do nowadays is uh, to do immediate dental implants rather than delayed dental implants in patients who are going to get um, uh, radiotherapy postoperatively. This gives the implants uh, four to six weeks to heal uh, before radiotherapy starts. And I think the, you know, the thought is even the uh, whatever um, changes occur to the bone still take many, many treatments uh, down the line, not even in the first week or two. So there's continual bony healing um, at least most of the way through the uh, radiotherapy process and that these dental implants have a higher likelihood of surviving um, and uh, being stable. Uh, I should say that uh, in regular non-radiated fibula bone, um, the success rate is quite high. It's almost as high as uh, putting dental implants in regular mandible or maxilla. Uh, for instance, in the indentulous population, um, uh, dental implants should have about a 99 uh, or 98% success rate. Uh, our own experience in the head and neck cancer population is is almost similar to that, about 98% success rate. In fibular bone, that goes down to about 92 or 93%, but that's still pretty high uh, per implant. And we'll put in, we'll try to put in a few more implants than we actually need and not necessarily use them, but save them as sleeper implants in case of a, a lost implant down the line. All right, thank you. The next question, um, our one of my co-ambassadors. So his question is, any tips uh, for intra-op challenges when BS has, BSP has to be modified, such as perforate anatomy, resection modification? Okay. Um, sorry, I got a message that I was muted, but I, I don't think so. Um, yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, uh, the... Um, I think some keys to uh, making sure that you aren't in a situation where um, your plan is not the right plan for the defect that you're being confronted with. One thing that we do is we try as much as possible to involve the oncologic surgeon um, in the planning process. It's actually usually multidisciplinary. I will usually do the planning process with the plastic surgeon, the oncologic surgeon, and the, and the dental or oral surgeon um, planning the reconstruction. I think getting up-to-date imaging is very important as well. Um, you know, if, if a CT scan, particularly in a cancer case, is many months old, uh, it's not going to be that useful uh, or, or as accurate. Um, and finally, you know, my personal strategy has been to tend to overestimate the defect. It's, um, it's easier uh, to accommodate uh, a fibula that's a little bit too large. Um, one, you could simply resect more mandible or maxilla. Or two, um, what I often do is just uh, if, if I have a longer, larger amount of mandible or maxilla left, I'll just cut a little groove or a little wedge into it for uh, to, to fit the fibula that makes the joint even more stable, kind of a tongue and groove uh, type of situation. But by and large, I think if you um, involve the oncologic surgeon and um, they understand uh, that, you know, we want to minimize the chances of intraoperative changes, um, it's really, really rare uh, that that scenario uh, comes up. All right, thank you. A lot of uh, uh, other uh, responders also had questions about that, and I think that uh, summarized a lot of those questions. So now Dr. Rurik has a question. His question is, what percent of a head and neck uh, reconstruction patients can you perform immediate dental implant placement? Uh, what's your long-term success rate? Yeah, you know, uh, 
This is uh, exciting new development for our group. We've probably been at it for about three or four years. So um, we're waiting to uh, collect our long-term data and submit it to PRS. Um, I would say, uh, you know, that we are fairly aggressive about putting dental implants in. Um, as I said, you know, our overall fibular uh, dental implant success rate is about 92 percent, 93 percent. Now, whether you know whether we will see a decline in patients who get radiated uh, in the immediate group or not remains to be seen. Uh, but I, you know, I, I do anecdotally feel that a lot of them are um, getting stable success. Uh, other groups have uh, even loaded their implants uh, immediately with uh, a prosthesis, albeit a, a temporary prosthesis, one that doesn't quite meet the opposing teeth that are a little bit more cosmetic, um, just so that the patient can, uh, you know. Uh, walk out with a, at least a cosmetic uh, dentition, a, a full smile, um, referred to as jaw in a day. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think that um, really contraindications uh, for us are fairly flexible. We tend not to do them in patients uh, with um, high risk for complications, uh, such as os uh, osteoarthritic necrosis patients who are actively infected. We do uh, worry and are conservative about putting dental implants into this uh, contaminated field. I think a lot of uh, viewers had a similar questions, and the next question is from Erdan Akor. Uh, thank you for a fantastic lecture. Do you also calculate soft tissue requirements preoperatively using uh, you know, we, we haven't. Uh, uh, some groups um, have uh, proposed using it for soft tissue. Uh, for instance, in breast reconstruction, um, th there, uh, th there's a group in Europe who uh, had proposed using um, surface, uh, um, surface uh, generated imagery of breast to create a breast mold and then um, then you put the free flap into the mold and trim around the edges uh, so, so uh, to facilitate uh, accurate volume restoration for breast reconstruction um, you know in head and neck reconstruction I, I find that uh, the soft tissue defect um, does change uh, frequently intraoperatively not just because of Positive margins, but just because of tissue viability, we you know we want to resect um, any tissue that doesn't look like it's uh, going to be viable, and so um, we're not there yet. I think it's a it's an excellent idea uh, to come up with a, a, a way to to do that. I I think you know the 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 best surgeries are um, uh, in reconstructive surgery are when you take a flap. Um, not not just get the flap to survive and and to um, and, and to close a wound uh, at a recipient site um, that you might later revise so that it looks better, but to to really prefabricate a flap so that it fits uh, like a glove into the defect. Uh, I think that's that's your safest, most accurate restoration. It's one that allows the patient um, to come out of recovery. Uh, without a significant deformity, um, which you know, even even deformities that are temporary, uh, I think are very difficult for patients to live with. And so, um, the more accurate we can be upfront, I think the be better service we are doing for our patients. Great. Uh, the next question is. Um, uh, question is Dr. Hansono, outside of head and neck reconstruction, where else do you find BS normally beneficial? Yeah. Hey, Lawrence. Um, so, uh, um, you know, aside from head and neck reconstruction, um, I think we're just starting to see um, uh, virtual surgical planning being used in orthopedic reconstruction, uh, spinal and long bone reconstruction. Uh, I think that uh, in pelvic reconstruction, I think that there's an advantage here, not just for um, the bony reconstruction on our end, 
but some of these very difficult access areas like the bony pelvis um, to have a, a patient-specific model available um, with uh, computer-generated cutting guides uh, makes operating in really these limited exposures deep in a hole uh, type expo uh, surgeries uh, more accurate and in turn then makes our reconstruction more accurate and, um, and uh, you know, uh, more conservative in, in terms of the amount of donor bone used. Right. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, sharing your wisdom and answering question at uh, Q&A for us. This is our last question. Uh, Kara is from Emily Long. Uh, it sounds like VSP has come a long way already. How do you think it can be improved? And what applications do you foresee being expanded to in the future? Yeah, it has come a long way. It's, it's interesting. Um, uh, you know, this is just one of those technologies, like uh, all technologies that we, we've seen. You know, I, I'm um, perhaps not for our, our youngest, um, let's see, I don't want to date myself too significantly, but let's take the iPhone. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an, it was a new technology, really an improvement on a pre-existing technology that, you know, there was a BlackBerry before it, and there was the, before that there was the Palm Pilot. Um, it, and really, um, it's an iteration of an improved technology that has to catch on. They, you have to prove that it's better than what you've uh, had in the past. Um, you have to get people to buy into it. And um, it really is, it does no good to, to come up with a technology or technique that um, nobody else will use. Uh, so, um, you know, I think uh, improvements will, will be necessary based on what, um, um, what the demand is, uh, what they are. I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, would, the more accurate, you know, we can be um, assured it's, it's great to, to come up with, you know, a robot doing the whole surgery for you, but we have to have uh, people buying into that as well. Um, you know, I, at one point, Roman Skraki and I, my, my, my partner in surgery, um, uh, talked to a robotics uh, specialists and um, uh, thought that perhaps the ultimate would be not only computer planned cutting guide, but computer planned oste or computer controlled osteotomies. That that could be a thing that that happens in the future as um, robot surgery uh, gets more advanced. But truthfully, I, I don't know what comes next. Only that in my short time in the business of surgery, um, uh, it's been amazing to me that the number of advances. Uh, both in terms of technology and in surgical uh, advances that have occurred. So um, those of you who are just starting out, um, you know, master the basics because what you do 10 years from now may be totally different than what you're training to do um, yeah, at this point. So, so you just have to be able to change with the times. All right, great. That was our last question. And thank you, Dr. Hanasono, for your time, especially on a Wednesday during the weekday. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. I know that it's not just the U.S., around all, all around the world. So thank you very much, uh, all the viewers. And then uh, the whole uh, discussion could be watched on the prsjournal.com tomorrow. So if you have missed any part of the uh, discussion or any questions, uh, please uh, refer back to the prsjournal.com. And Thank you again, Dr. Hanasono. Thank you, Dr. Rorick. And thank you, Aaron and Maddie and all the PRS staff for uh, recreating this fantastic event for us. Thank you.